Hello there guys and welcome to another episode of Genuine Chit Chat. This week I'm joined by Matthew B. Lloyd, the host of the Classic Comics podcast, which can be found on the feed of Comics in Motion, just like my Star Wars show. So in our conversation we talk about how Matt first got into comics and his love of history pushing him to the golden age of comics, which the golden age is set around 1940 to 1960, uh, why he started his podcast, then a bit towards the end of the show we then speak about the Star Wars comics from the 70s and 80s and they are a lot of fun. Part two of the conversation will be out next week on this very feed as usual. However, all Patreons all get access to this for as little as one pound a month. You could be listening to part two of this episode in a full unsplit episode along with part one. Plus you'd get access to my Afterthoughts show that I do with Megan, which episodes release like once or twice a week. So, you know, go over to patreon.com slash genuine chit chat to check that out. And if you wish to contribute to this show financially. Now, just before the chat gets started, very briefly, um, I do mention, I can't remember if it's in this part or the second part, but we talk about a character called Jackson Rabbit in Legends, which is like this anthropomorphic rabbit creature. Um, He is actually canon. He is in the Star Wars Adventures comics, which are aimed at a slightly younger audience. They're made by IDW instead of Marvel. They're still canon and whatnot, but I haven't delved into the Star Wars Adventures comics that much yet. So I just want to clarify that for when that gets mentioned. And the other small thing is that the audio in this, um, the audio sounds fine. You can hear what we are saying and whatnot, but occasionally with Matt, it goes a little bit weird and kind of half clicky for a few moments. It's very much temporary, and as soon as it starts happening, it almost stops pretty straight away after. But I just want to clarify to you guys if you get to one of those points and you hear the audio sounding a little bit odd, it does sort itself out quickly and it doesn't happen very frequently throughout this. So, with all that preamble out of the way, let's get the show started. So, Here comes Matthew B. Lloyd from Classic Comics, and I'll be back at the very end of the show to give you guys what's coming up in part two, what I've got in the bank for recording, and all the other stuff I'm getting up to. So, here we go. Welcome to Genuine Chit Chat, where we have honest conversations with interesting people, and I'm your host, Mike Burton. And I am here today with Matthew B. Lloyd of the all-powerful Classic Comics, and you've got your hands in many pies, so I will let you introduce yourself. Matt, tell the wonderful people who you are and what you're involved in. Hi, I uh, thank you for having me, Mike. First off, um, I'm really excited to talk today. My name is Matthew Lloyd. I have my hand in the pie of DC Comics News, where I do... uh, reviews weekly of of current dc comics as well as some independent comics uh i also am the news editor there so with uh new uh news writers for that website i get to walk them through the process and help them get to the point where they can self-publish and they don't need me i also of course have the classic comics podcast on the comics in motion network where i cover comics before the silver age so i'm focusing essentially on golden age comics old newspaper strips uh there'll probably eventually be something on uh something before the official golden age of comics that's you know obscure that i'll get interested in at some point uh (laughs) i have also contributed to a book uh on batman called politics in gotham the batman universe and political thought friend of mine from college ian drake and i wrote a uh, a chapter for that and that came out a couple years ago and then we've also just recently heard that a chapter we're doing for a book on the black panther uh is going to come out in february of 2022 it goes to the publisher uh a little bit later this year so we're excited to to get that out there it's been a lot of fun working with him and uh, you can also, of course, catch me on numerous podcast appearances with uh, folks on the Comic Motion Network, as well as other podcasts uh, with uh, Storytelling with Seth, where we talked about Will Eisner. And then I've got one with uh, Scott's 20th Century Geek coming out soon uh, that we've just recorded. So uh, it's it's been so much fun doing all these. It's uh, great just to talk about stuff you love and share your passion with others, because uh, the way it is, it's not like we're talking about the local sports team that so many people are excited about we're talking about stuff that you have to go out of the country sometimes to find interest in so it's been a lot of fun <laughs> well I, i've really enjoyed your show like so anyone who's listening i'll have probably done some sort of preamble in the intro and there'll be links in the description um but your show as you said airs on comics in motion along with my other show styles comics and canon and then lots of our mutual friends shows as well and your show when i first heard about the premise bluntly i wasn't necessarily that excited because i was like oh super old comics i got it's not that i've looked into it and i don't care it's the fact that they were so out of my 
even peripherals or even knowledge. They hadn't. I hadn't even thought about it. I was like, oh yeah, well, I, I vaguely know Captain America was from like the forties, and I know that Spider-Man I think was around the sixties or something. So I know there's that sort of. You go back far enough. There's an era of comics that I've not even touched, but I've only recently been getting into a sort of modern comics. Star Wars comics has only been a thing for me for a few years as well. So like, aside from like the odd comic and like things like the Beano and whatnot, it essentially is the last probably the last five years has been the main time that I've been sort of consuming comics and things. So when I first heard about the premise, I wasn't overly excited by it because I was like, ah, I don't know. I listened to a few episodes and I was like, wow, <laughs> there's. They're so interesting in so many layers of it. There's there's the fun ones which are like you know, the the original Daredevil who is a mute guy with a boomerang, <laughs> and you've got like which is the most bizarre. I, I love how bizarre they are. I think that's one of my favorite things when I listen to classic comics. Is like okay, so this idea is basically batshit crazy, yeah. and this idea is really clever and grounded, and they just kind yeah. of run the two for like yeah. five years, yeah. really weirdly, and then they disappear off the face of the earth for like twenty years, and then suddenly, normally someone at Marvel goes, oi take a bit of that take a bit of that or they just speak to the person who made them and said hey can we just you know change Daredevil in basically every conceivable way and then give them a horrendous yellow outfit so yeah let's do that so I I want to ask with like classic comics I've heard you explain it but I love your explanation so what what made you because I've listened to I think you on other shows I think Super Heroes or or something you explained it so if anyone's listening gutted because I want to hear it again what got you into classic comics because obviously you you didn't live or you weren't a kid in the 1940s. You didn't live no, in the 1940s. No, no, my dad was, but I wasn't. <laughs> what made me like that? Um, you know, well, I started I started reading comics obviously as a little boy. Um, and I think the oldest superhero comics I have are a 100 uh, page giant Wonder Woman and Detective comics from the same month in 1974. Um, it's what Wonder Woman 211 and Detective 440 or something like that, and uh, they are old as you can believe. And for whatever reason, the first half of them is ripped out on both. I, I don't know whatever happened to them. Huh. I don't ever actually remember having the first half uh, in my, in my entirety of memory. It's always just been the the half issues <laughs> that are left. But I'm sure. <laughs> but I know I got them in their entirety. I know they weren't. You know, I know they were brand new when I got them. Uh, and in those issues, there are Golden Age reprints of Wonder Woman and various characters from uh, the 40s and, and elsewhere in the detective. The Wonder Woman is all Wonder Woman. Uh, so at a very young age, I, I was exposed to uh, classic comics, old comics. And at the time, in the early 70s, they were only, you know, not even 30 years old uh, or about 30 years old, you know. And I guess there's something in me that is uh, ingrained as far as history goes. Uh, I have a master's degree in art history, so I I always like history. I like history. One of my favorite shows, and y'all, you guys in England will, will know this show, Time Team. I don't know if you guys mm. ever watched it, but my children roll their eyes and make horrible comments when I say I'm going to watch Time Team because they think it's hilarious. <laughs> they think it's hilariously boring that I watch such a a show, but you know, I, I, you know, like Indiana Jones, I wanted to be, you know, an archaeologist at one point, and so art history and old things and knowing where things come from from the beginning. So when I was, so when I was a kid and I was reading, you know, the newest Batman or whatever, I always had in the back of my mind, well, those are those old comics that I had when I was real little that I've only got half of. Oh, and there are these old stories. Oh, here's a Green Lantern story about a blonde guy with a red shirt and a purple cape. Where's the green part come in? Oh, it's his pants are green. <laughs> his pants are green? His pants are green. So uh, so I always knew there was something else. And in the later 70s, DC revived uh, All-Star Comics and put all the Earth 2 characters, which are the original Golden Age versions of the superheroes they had, uh, uh, in, in a book. And I got some of those. And by the time All-Star Squadron came out in 1981, uh, I was already – full into old stuff golden age stuff i wanted to learn more i would go to conventions as a kid and try to find golden age books where uh they wouldn't break the bank you know back then you could still find some uh golden age books five six bucks which back then was a lot more than it is now but it was still a a good deal even 10 or 15 dollars was a good deal back then for a golden age book i you couldn't buy these books that i bought back then for that price now you still be in the hundreds and i'm even to this day i'm probably not ever going to spend more than 
30 or 40 dollars on a comic you know i'll buy a collection <laughs> off uh amazon or something and and get you know tons of issues for the same price you get i don't have that collecting fervor anymore but maybe a little bit for stuff from the 70s that is uh hardcore nostalgic like uh some of the old star wars comics that came out when i was a kid that's that's been a recent uh fervor as well as uh collecting the rest of the uh john carter of mars series that marvel did in the 70s i completed that run a little while ago so but anyways having that historical bent in my nature i've always wanted to look back and i guess i guess continuity is always something i enjoyed with with comics is the idea that this character started in the 40s got older got married didn't get married had kids didn't have kids uh or whatever and they they in the 60s and 70s they they tried to to fill build fill in the story that what happened to these guys in those ensuing 30 40 years so that there was like a real a real life there with uh with families and relationships and uh real life issues but also uh real life relationships you know the golden age batman has a daughter that becomes the huntress and the whole story where he and catwoman get married now that stuff is just it's just great stuff it it, it makes him it, it adds something that you don't get in the comics where they're perpetually 36 years old and you know superman is never going to marry lois lane he's just gonna you know you know perpetually long for her all those kind of things that it, it adds a sense of realism and uh I, I guess relatability that while it's it's fun it's uh it's more fun to have those other things. And so I really lament the, the loss of that in comics. However, uh, you know, Superman did actually get married in continuity back in the 90s. So that was cool. Uh, Batman and Catwoman are finally, it looks like they are supposed to be together as a couple. And I can't imagine they're going to go backwards on that. It's a little too late for that. Uh, they've reinstituted Aquaman and Mara's marriage, which was at the time in the 60s, they got married and had a kid in the 60s. That was the first character to really get married in continuity and stay married until the uh, New 52 uh, destroyed all that uh, continuity. <laughs> but anyways, it's it's those kind of things. And I'm always looking back. I'm always interested in seeing where these things came from, and especially when you look at the, uh, the creators. Because if you look at the uh, newspaper strips of the 30s and 40s, those creators are are light years ahead of what's going on in – most comic books there are very few comic books at the time that come close to having uh that kind of storytelling uh maturity and, and skill in in the craft uh so when you look at people like uh milton kniff uh hal foster alex raymond that stuff is off the charts you look at it today and you're still just stunned at the uh the quality of it and the depth of, of a lot of it. And in the, and then in the regular comics, they were, you know, eight, 10, 12 page stories that were villain of the month kind of stuff. Batman beats this guy, Superman beats this guy. And there's no real depth or uh, subtlety to it, but the newspaper ships, cause they were long, cause they were long form and they had a, uh, the time to, to really craft a story they, they could do a lot of different things and, and they and they were being written for adults as well because back in back then i mean sure adults read you know the you know the far side and funny uh newspaper strips that are in the, the papers today but back then there were just tons of adventure uh i'm i'm at steve's house it's it's, uh, <laughs> it's a sign <laughs> i'm at steve's house steve they're coming for you <laughs> uh i do actually do live down the street from the fire station i didn't think about that <laughs> um, it doesn't matter it's fine <laughs> uh oh adults they were for adults um it wasn't simply you know a humor gag strip for four or five panels they were telling stories that had to involve adults as well because adults look forward to reading these uh these newspaper strips as well uh when milton kniff left terry and the pirates in 1945 to start steve canyon a strip he was going to own when it first ran newspapers ran it at the uh at the top of the masthead above the title of the paper so it was literally oh. the first thing you saw that's how much excitement there was about that and that wasn't because there were you know 11 12 year old kids excited there were adults that were excited about it because they knew how good kniff was they had enjoyed tearing the pirates some of them probably for the past you know 15 years since they were kids and now they're adults still reading and still interested in uh 
in in the comics. So so yeah, I, I just it's it's part of my nature to want to look back and see where things started and they began. Uh, with classic comics, you get to see where characters started, how they started, how they're different. You get to see where they came from because without all those things in the past, we aren't where we are today. Uh, there's no there's no way uh, you get comics of today without what came previously. And you know the Star Wars uh, uh, book we we were we're going to touch on some uh, has Al Williamson in it, who's one of those. Uh, uh, phenomenal creators uh, that is so important to the development of comic book art and storytelling and his uh, his own story is, is, is pretty cool but we won't get too much into that but uh, you know knowing to see these creators in the 40s and to see who the best ones were and who they influenced as you go along and you go oh well that's why we have Bernie Wrightson. That's why we have Neil Adams. That's why we have Jim Steranko. And then you see stuff today and they go, oh, they're ripping off so-and-so. No, they're ripping off so-and-so who ripped off so-and-so from 19, mm. you know, 43. And then, uh, yeah, I, it's, it's that. So it's those old comics are passion. I mean, even like some of the stuff I've gotten to do on my show were things that I'd always heard about. Uh, uh, Miss Fury was a, a newspaper strip that I'd, I'd heard about. I'd heard a little bit about, I was familiar with what the character looked like, but I'd never actually tried to track anything down. And part of it's because there's not a lot out there to track down. But what I did get was the most recent collected edition of the first half of her, her strip. Uh, and, uh, you know, I just really enjoy the heck out of it. And it's so, it's so indicative of newspaper strips, but at the same time, it has its own uh, innovations and things that are they're different. It was the first newspaper. It was the first superhero created by a woman and produced by a woman uh, creator. Mm -hmm. It wasn't uh, you know some man writing about women. It was a woman uh, writing and drawing about a woman as the lead character, and it's you know it's got its own subtleties and nuances to it that uh, that are going to be different. So, and that for me was like. You know, what do I want to read next? Oh, I want to read this next. Well, guess what? It's going to be a show. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one of the weird and brilliant things about having a podcast. Because I've spoken about uh, this sort of idea with a lot of the guys in Comics in Motion. And it's a sort of thing where now I have fun reading and I have work reading in a sense of like, and oh, often they do merge. You know, I, I do my Stars podcast for passion. I'm not getting paid to do my Stars podcast. It'd be lovely if I was, but I'm not. And it's just like, I, when I got into Star Wars comics and whatnot, I was collecting that 70 80 percent of them i'd say that ones that really grabbed me and there were some that i wasn't as fussed on anymore but i kind of was like well i've still I want to keep them going because I've kind of got them. And then when I did the Star Wars show and I've had to go back to certain stories I either didn't uh, enjoy as much or I've had to buy comics that I was like, initially, I was like, I don't care about the story. And now I'm doing comics in canon. I'm like, okay, I'm trying to do all of the stories <laughs> of the new canon. Let's just tackle this one. And then you read it and you go, oh man, that is bloody brilliant. Why on earth did I, why has this one slipped by me for so long? I just read it and went, no, I'm just by that. And it's one of those weird things where having a podcast is like, you have all your own work to yourself but it's a, it's a labor of love and it's one of those things where even if i'm like oh man i need to read you know five issues of dr afra in four days yeah. and write all the notes about it and blah 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 when i'm doing it, i'm having a great fun it's not like doing work work so i'm like i want to do this and also you know everyone tries to have their schedule and stuff but also mm. the nice thing is that although we have our uh our daily or bi-weekly schedules and things it's like if something happened for whatever reason and you can't make it, no one's going to have, you know, no one's going to have a go. It's just like, oh, something coming up in your personal life. That's okay. Don't worry about it. Whereas at work, it's like, yeah, I just, you know, I had a kind of a bad day, so I just did no emails for like eight hours. They're not going to be like, ah, don't worry about it. You know what I mean? So it's one of those weird things. But listening to your show about classic comics and not only how passionate you are on your show itself, but on other podcasts, it's infectious. And one of the things as well is that like... um from you talking about, you know, some of the old school Star Wars stuff and some of the things, there is just a lot of fun quirks in old school stuff. Oh, yeah. And it's as you say, oh, yeah. it, it's like, as you say, like one of the things Dave Horrocks always says is I think it's in the original, in the 1970, uh, I've got it written down it, 1977 Star Wars comics, which the first six issues were basically just redos of A New Hope. I'm pretty certain that Darth Vader is holding like a coffee cup in one of the oh, panels or oh, something. Oh, there's something like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and it's just like, well, Darth Vader, obviously nowadays, is, you know, this is 40 plus years ago, it was just, oh, Darth Vader is this cool looking villain and that was basically yeah. all you know. Yeah. Now there's so much backstory to it. It's like, well, Darth Vader doesn't 
really eat. So <laughs> he ha- that's not how he consumes food. So him having a coffee, mm. how he, he has his breather basket. <laughs> if he poured coffee in that, he would probably die. <laughs> so it's just like... It was a cup of coffee that was going to splash on an Imperial general that it pissed him off. <laughs> hot coffee in the face. That's the only reason he has it. <laughs> yeah, just yeah. splashing hot coffee at people. That's the weapon of the Sith in the yeah. 70s. Yeah. Make sure you come back to that because there's something really neat in issue five of the original Star Wars that um, I, I'm going to mention eventually. Let's make a note of it because I want to come back to yeah. mention that because it's something that's really – that actually to me is really cool and not just quirky. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> but that's wonderful. No, that's – please always um, – it's one of those things where I found that <sighs> – it's as you say, there's so many layers of looking back that there's so many cool things with it. There's either, you know, there's the aspect of you can see influences. There's the aspect of you can see what really... Because certain people go, you know... Um, some people ask me the odd question when it comes to Star Wars. I, I'm not sure I can think of an exact example, but they go, why haven't they done this in Star Wars? Or why have they done that? And I go, oh, because they tried that ages ago and it didn't work because everyone <laughs> hated it. That's what, They tried this. They did, you know, that's what Legends is. That's, that's basically all the experimentation they did for the last 40 years. And so with... I'm... There's so many aspects of where I can go with this. So let's just delve into the Star Wars newspaper strips. So with the newspaper strips themselves, I didn't even know there were Star Wars newspaper strips until you told me oh, like, wow. a few months ago. Whatever. Yeah, yeah. Because obviously they released. Um, I have some notes here as well where it's just like they were obviously released in I think 1979. Well, there's the Star Wars newspaper strips and there's the Star Wars comics. The the original comics were 77, but I think the strips were 79. I think that's but right. Obviously, yeah, I wasn't yeah. born then. So right. <laughs> I've only, so that's only, if, sorry, but I, I wasn't born there, obviously. And then because I've been getting much more into Star Wars over the last five, 10 years, all the new focus is basically on the new canon. So right. everything in Legends gets put to the wayside. And I seem to remember, I looked this up online when I was doing a Q, the Star Wars Q&A episode I did a, a couple of days ago, which thank you for your lovely questions there. <laughs> um, but it was, I had to look up specifically stuff because one of the things was about uh, canon and Legends. And nowadays you've just got canon or you've got legends and aside from the lego stuff that's really there's the two defining things and i just talk if people don't know it's basically just legends is rumors which is if it doesn't contradict something it could have happened but there could be something that comes out in the canon that contradicts it and therefore it didn't happen there's, there's loads of little holes in time you can fill in with legend stuff but before disney took over there were layers of canon I didn't realize. There were like, there was core canon, which was A, which I think was the films. Then there was B canon, which was certain books. Then there was C canon, but the comics were like D canon. So they were listed as like the, the least canonical <laughs> canon stuff, which is really alien. And when I explained it to Megan, she was like, oh, I can see why they changed it. And I was yeah. like, yeah, you hear all these butthurt Star Wars fans go, I hate Disney. Why do they recanon it? It's like, you had four tiers of canon before. What do you expect? So what... With the Star Wars newspaper strips and the comics and things, I mean, why don't we start off with that sort of caveat you said? Before we forget, in uh, the, the Star Wars comic, I think you said it was issue number six. There's something crazy there. Let's just put that in there, and then we'll kind of go from there. Well, I'll let you kind of vaguely take the lead on if you want to talk about newspapers or the comics more. But like, okay. this is not the realm I know much of. Oh, well, recently, uh, well, first I'm going to preface everything by saying before I started my podcast, I had to figure out how how I was going to do a show that was just me talking about comics without a guest because I know my own schedule is so wacky. There's no way I could have a guest every week, nor would I know enough people to draw in uh, about classic comics. It'd be like, hey, what did you give the original Daredevil? It'd be like, huh? Oh, okay. So uh, <laughs> I have I, had to look up almost everything you talk about, by the way, to clarify. <laughs> like I had to go back when you talk about like, the old school Captain America. I was like, I think that's on Marvel Unlimited. I can go back and read that first issue where he's punching Hitler on the front. But yeah. like most of these issues, I've come near. So your show has made me look at all them. But as you say, like if you, hey, hey, Mike, do you want to come on the show talk about Captain America, like the original one from the forties? Like not really. I don't know anything <laughs> about it. I've never even heard of it, really. So I totally get where you're coming from there. Uh, but so Tony in his discussions with me about the show before it started he said mike mike does a star wars uh comics uh show and it's just him so you should probably check that you might want to check that out this is, i thought well gosh I, I think i'll listen to mike's show so I, I i listened to a couple episodes and we were laying on the sofa and i just sort of slowly fell into a uh story time with mike feeling like like you were telling me a story <laughs> and it was really being able to hear your show to figure out how i could do a show i knew it wouldn't all be uh we're going to go through and tell the stories like you do. Uh, but I knew that it gave me the idea. Okay. So I can do some of that. I can prepare some stuff. I can 
wax about you know why I love something so much, which is something you get to as you're reading. You all of a sudden start talking about oh, and this is really cool because of this and this, and they're talking about this other issue over here. And well, we talked about that in that other book. We that was episode blah 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 that I did, and so you're all you get all excited about it, and so that that is infectious as well. And that uh, that not only gave me the uh, the the idea of how I could do my show. Uh, and feel confident about it, but it also got me thinking about Star Wars comics as a kid. Uh, and you know, because I'm I'm 51, I was seven when the first movie came out, which to me is still just called Star Wars. There's that A New Hope business was added later on. Uh, I still remember sitting in the theater. I remember the theater we went to. I remember the uh, uh, you know the friends I went with. I remember sitting there and the title scrawl, and I remember that moment where the screen is black and the first little uh, rebel ship comes pew, pew, doo, 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 and then all of a sudden the the shore and everyone just went like they were expecting it to come out of the top of this it was so startling to all of us it's like uh, it was still, still one of the i think most effective openings i've ever seen in a movie uh just to shake you immediately um i still have that so you know and i remember you know i got the luke skywalker figure everybody wanted to see the after seeing the movie but he was so popular he was sold out. He was on back order. You couldn't find him at any toy store. So I, I settled for Luke. Um, but you know, as a kid, so I'm, I, I remember buying some of the comics at the, the local uh, drugstore when they first came out. Uh, the first six issues uh, when they, uh, when they were just, you know, redoing a new hope. So, so your show and listening to you tell the stories and stuff and hearing these new stories that are not part of the, the canon any are that 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 are part of the canon as opposed to anything i had read or before uh it, it just kind of got my my juices going and thought man i'm gonna get my old star wars comics out and then i went on ebay and got a couple more star wars comics and a couple more <laughs> my wife's like why are these comic books arriving oh yeah i wanted to read that <laughs> we need to sell comics not not keep anymore i know but but and it's actually it's actually it's spread into you know other things uh uh other comics that i wanted to get uh and that kind of is where the the star wars uh thing comes in because we were talking about uh the uh issue issue five of the original one let me do that first and i'll get on to the what i was going to say next in issue five which is part of the adaptation of the uh, a new hope uh from the 70s is uh Issue five has a scene with Luke and Biggs in the uh, in uh, on Yavin before they go off to it, and there's like a whole bit about them knowing each other on Tatooine beforehand, and I don't know why, but I, I didn't know that. I had not recalled that that I read that you know thirty some years it's ago. It's a deleted scene, I think, but I only yeah. recently found out yeah, about that. It, but I think it's like a deleted scene. So in the actual yeah. cut, you don't really know exactly, much about it. Exactly, but but you see it in the comic, and I thought, oh man, that is so cool. And I immediately thought, is that something that came from the original script or what? Or did uh, did the who was doing that one? I don't remember who the writer on that adaptation is. It's Roy Thomas. I wondered, did Roy Thomas add this, or is this something that? Uh, was there that they just put in that didn't make the movie but i just thought it was really cool that it was in there and it just added a little bit of depth to uh the uh the story that you don't get uh you know it's maybe it's not necessary in the uh in the theatrical cut of the film but it just adds something and it makes the whole uh discussion of you know hitting Womp Rats and Beggar's Canyon from however many yards or meters or whatever it is, it gives it a, a more of a context as opposed to just like, oh, it's like hitting Womp Rats and Beggar's Canyon, you know, and, and why would anybody know what the hell that means? You know, if you were in that <laughs> briefing room with Luke, here's this guy, here's this hit guy from Nowheresville, you know, talking about something that nobody else, everybody in the room, I'm surprised that, you know, what are you talking about? You know, but he was talking to Biggs because Biggs remembers doing that with him on Tatooine when they were younger. So it, I don't know. I really liked that. I thought it was really neat. Anytime I see something like that, I know I asked you one time, uh, when was the first instance of calling uh, Darth Vader a Sith? And you said it happened in like the novelization or something where it's mentioned. Yeah. And so I didn't, cause the first, I was just shocked that it was in some of the early comics. So, uh, so, so early that it was way before, uh, you know, empire came out. It was only a few months after, um, uh, 
the first one came out. So I was surprised that it was in the comics, but you you said it was in the novelization, which is something if I've read, it's been a really long time. I know I have it. I know I, I have it. We got it as a kid, like I was going to read it when I was seven. I wasn't, but we had it. <laughs> um, but I just thought that was really. So anyways, um, to skip back from that really cool part about Biggs to uh, the newspaper ships and where I was going, that was one of the things uh, – you know, with classic comics is these great creators. And one of the, one of the artists, and I guess I kept seeing it on online little, uh, on a Facebook group of pictures of, uh, some of the pages from Al Williamson's, uh, work on star Wars, either from the newspaper strips or from, he does the adaptation in the ongoing Marvel comic, uh, star Wars, you know, of the empire strikes back movie. He does the adaptation of that he, he's the artist on that. And it's just some great images and stuff. I go, man, you know, I, I've never, I've never seen much of his star Wars stuff. I need to, I need to get some of that. Cause Al Williamson is so great. And Mike keeps talking about all the star Wars stuff and I'm listening to a show and it's interesting. I want to see what, what that stuff looks like. So that was my inspiration for getting the, uh, uh, the newspaper strips book that were, that we're ostensibly talking about at some point. Uh, mm -hmm. But what really shocked me when I opened it up to the first page, I wasn't really paying attention uh, when I bought it. I thought it was going to be mostly Williamson. And I opened it up to the first page and there it is, Star Wars by Russ Manning. And I went, Russ Manning? No way. Russ Manning uh, was uh, the creator of a, of a comic book in the uh, 60s called Magnus Robot Fighter which clearly took place in the future and it's 4000 AD is the part of the title too. So it takes place in, in the year 4000 and humanity has been uh, not devastated, but their robots do everything for people practically. And his whole mission is to uh, get people stop relying on robots and uh, over uh, over reliance on technology. Sounds familiar, right? <laughs> Except that he is raised by a robot. He has his, he's an orphan who is raised by a robot, uh, kind of like, uh, you know, Tarzan's raised by apes. He's raised by a robot. But his, his whole mission is, and it's part of this robot's mission, is to get Magnus to help people stop relying. But anyways, the art by Russ Manning is really, really good. Uh, it's, it's very clean and uh, smooth lines. It's not a lot of, uh, uh, you know, busy work. It's very, very very good and uh he was a big inspiration on uh an artist from the 80s who started in the 80s in comics named steve rude who did a series uh creator and series called nexus which is one of my absolute favorite comics of all time and i, I had not remembered that but as i'm looking at this russ manning stuff in the star wars book i go man this looks so much like at times, like Steve Rude, just the the clean the clean lines, the uh, the the lack of uh, of busy work in the, in the art, and I was just like, oh man! And I looked up Steve Rude, and I remembered, that's right, he did a, a Nexus and Magnus crossover at one point, and then it came back to me. He was a huge Manning fan, so I had to go online and start buying. Uh, old issues of Magnus Robot Fighter I didn't have. <laughs> that, so it, it kind of, you know, just jumped in uh, uh, to different areas. So, but anyways, when, when, when I opened up the, the Star Wars uh, uh, newspaper book here that we, we've got, you know, I just, you know, there was this really clean lines. And what, what I was struck by most was how some stuff looks just like Star Wars and some stuff looks not at all like Star Wars. Like as you think about it now, it's so early. It is so early in people's uh, outside work with the the universe that there are things that look spot on, and other things that just look like you wouldn't you wouldn't see that in a Star Wars comic or or a, <laughs> or a Star Wars universe. The 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 style the the. What am I looking for? The design style, the you know, production design mm. style of like a robot or a spacesuit or clothes. You know, you know, you've got this girl that's dressed. I tell you, what, if you if you look at one of those pages I I sent, there's mm -hmm. Han Solo's in the in the Falcon, and he he looks like Han Solo, and he's even got the little smirk and sneer on his face. But the girl in it is dressed like he would have dressed one of his characters in Magnus. That 
almost see-through dress where just the uh, the dark parts cover the naughty bits, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like that's something he would draw in Magnus. That's a that's a, a, a 60s version of the future dress. You know what I mean? And those mm. kind of things really struck me. But but the the stories are so are so fun. And he's such a good storyteller. He also did a, a long run on Tarzan in the comic strips. Uh, Mag- uh, Ma- yeah. Russ Manning did Tarzan in the, com- the, com- the newspapers for a long time as well. So it's just – and I just love looking at like a whole page as opposed to the individual panels. The, the whole page kind of works to lead your eye through the right way, and it's, it's, a, it's a whole page approach that I, uh, I enjoy about – newspaper strips i mean there's so much interesting stuff that you get content wise and like i said some stuff feels right and some stuff just feels like nobody would dress like that in star wars <laughs> <laughs> well i have interest with it then so with the, the newspaper strips obviously um when i think of newspaper strips i think of garfield right. that's the big thing right. I, right. I got really into garfield uh, weirdly enough in college i bought like loads of garfield books just full of just three panels essentially and i remember like com- i want to clarify completely sober 16 year old just staying up late at night reading like hours of garfield i don't know what it was it's, it's mental but like when i think of newspaper strips i think of just three panels next to each other and that's it and that's what snoopy was like that's what garfield was like etc etc um from the photos that you've shown me with the star wars ones were they like half a page were they full page like how were they newspaper strips how were they done and are they different to how say other newspaper strips are done at that time in America? Well, I'll jump back to how they used to be done in the 30s and 40s. You would get a whole page for a Sunday page. You would get a whole page. And then later on, they went to like half a page. And then by the time we roll around to the 70s and 80s, for a Sunday, I think you could fit three three Sunday strips on a page. Hmm. Uh, and during the week, you know, you still only had small three or four panels. So what what they did in the old days, sometimes the Sundays would tell one story and the daily strip would tell a different story. And Mm. a lot of strips eventually merged their storytelling into one one story. Uh, But it required Mm. a lot of skill on part of the uh, the artist slash writer to recap what had happened during the week since the last Sunday page, because oddly enough, some some newspapers would only carry things on Sunday. But they wouldn't carry that mm-hmm. particular strip during the week. So they had to make sure that if you were only carrying the Sunday page, you figured out what happened during the week until the next Sunday page. So you couldn't have you know, a massive amount of stuff happen. But then again, in a modern comic book, it would only be the equivalent of two or three pages at the most during the dailies that came out. So to answer your question, I think it would take about a third of the page, and then the mm-hmm. dailies would be – three or four panels which is not mm-hmm. a whole lot of stuff to tell but uh one thing that this book does that my favorite parts of the book as far as format go are the beginning where you have the full sunday page reprinted you know it's a full mm-hmm. sunday page because it's never been reprinted anywhere else it's just a full sunday page but then they have this uh, high this other technique where they describe in the back thankfully where it looks more like a regular comic, but those are actually dailies mm. that have been cut up and recolored and retouched to tell a comic book story. Wow. So when Dark Horse got the Star Wars license for comics, whenever they got it, I don't recall when, 80s, 90s, they got mm. actually went back and got the old strips and reprinted them in regular comic book form, and it was called Classic Star Wars The Early Adventures. So this first one, this first issue of that that's in here is actually the weekdays and saturdays from march 12th to may 10th 1979 so that's Mm. what we have and it looks like a regular comic um but it's been retouched and edited just enough so that there's not too much overlap or or anything like that and 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 i guess what i don't like about that is on one hand is you kind of miss the the whole single page look of the sunday page but but these are dailies and i've read enough dailies in the past that i'm fine with having just individual strips on the page but it does i guess make sense to do it this way for reprinting it as a comic in a comic book for a comic book audience in the in the 90s when these came out so 
I, I can I guess I can forgive them for that, but I think I <laughs> like the other way better. That's just a personal preference, though. I was going to say because some of the photos and things that you sent over because I'll when I upload this uh, whenever it gets released and things on social media and etc I'll make sure I put some uh, the photos that you sent me up and things uh, so people can have an idea of what some of the art stuff and like and obviously a lot of it is quite striking but I actually went um, I had a little look when you first spoke to me about the newspaper strips and stuff and I found that probably the best way for people uh, to get all of them there seem to be two and it's basically all of the Star Wars Legends comics including like really old like the other ones we were discussing from literally the 70s uh, so from the year styles came out onwards they've been rebranded into the star wars legends epic collections and then there's basically there's ones about the old republic there's ones about the clone wars there's like collections and one of the collections is the newspaper strips and there appear to be two volumes of it yes and yes. I, is it and it looks I've, I've seen online but like the fact that from where you've been showing me because obviously we're speaking with video and audio from where you've shown me the amount of work that must have gone in to not only rearrange those sort of dailies to make it cohesive, but also I noticed that like the formatting of the book itself, like the half pages, you have to turn the book sideways. Yeah. And yeah. That's yeah. Like, it, the amount of work, it must be insane. Yeah. There's, there's a really nice uh, explanation actually in the back of the book that goes through mm-hmm. how a classic new fisher strip became a comic book series uh, from uh, one of the editors at Dark Horse Comics. It goes through the whole process. And what's really mm. cool is it goes through the, uh, the specific, some of the specific process with uh, the later ones when it's uh, Al Williamson and mm-hmm. Al and I think as much as I enjoy the Russ Manning stuff and ever I, I enjoyed the whole book immensely. It was so much fun mm-hmm. to read. And if you like Star Wars, even if you don't have a a, a nostalgic feel for the 70s stuff, it I think it's still a fun read because it's characters you're familiar with. They get the uh, the speech patterns right they get i can hear harrison ford and when i read this i can hear him with some of his uh you know okay princess you know (laughs) your highness your royalness yeah one of the things i noticed what you sent me is i noticed that quite a lot and i think that luke as a character generally until return of the jedi really he's quite boring he's quite a whine the term that people often describe him as which is what they call anakin in the prequels is a whiny little bitch and whenever (laughs) he comes on screen that's what megan always calls luke she her she always calls him that and leia's a very very cool strong character as well but obviously she's a well she's a very cool strong character that's fine but when you read it in comics it's down to kind of your own interpretation but i find that regardless if they're legends or um canon all of the stuff i've read which has han solo in it it always feels like han solo i'm happy because the writers have got the right thing for it like there's a couple of there's a couple of comics and i don't laugh very, i don't think many people do but i don't laugh very much while reading especially not reading star wars comics because they're not <laughs> comedies but there's certain times there's a few solo comics where you read it or a couple of the lando ones are really good as well the new ones and you read them and you go this is so like it's so so close it's upsetting me that this wasn't in a film or something because that line is so funny and so perfect and i think that with some of the things you sent me there's quite a few of those where you just go oh han yeah. you know even though it's not a real person you can feel the, the sort of um the way he says things his mannerisms the way he talks you can feel his charisma coming off page the uh, the last bit that's uh by archie goodwin and al williamson takes that to even another level to where the way the other characters are reacting to him it's right out of the it's his personality his 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 uh you know before the end of a new hope he's you know he's out for himself he's he's not a team player all those and all those things come through even in the other ancillary characters that you maybe only meet for this particular story that ran for you know two months or whatever and we never see again even those characters contribute to his characterization and that it builds this bigger picture that he's been like this for a while. He's, this is not, you know, he's not just dropped into a new hope as this kind of guy. Um, because one, one of these stories is uh, actually adapts a uh, early Han Solo novel, uh, Han Solo at Star's End. You ever heard of that one? Um, I'm not sure I have, but there's, I know there's a lot of them, but yeah. Yeah, it, it's an early one. So the fact that it was adapted in 1980, you know, it was early. Uh, and mm. it takes place, obviously, maybe you don't know this, it takes place before A New Hope. 
So it's a oh okay prequel for him at least, you know, to uh, the events of A New Hope, and you know they're able to work at things like you know Jabba and there's a bounty on his head and he's trying to do these different things to escape or whatever. And uh, it's, it's really done. It's really well done. And, and you really, it feels like they're really working the character a lot. And in the last, uh, in the last, I don't mean to jump to the end of the book, but we're just going all over the place. In the last story, um, they do a lot with Luke and Leia and the, uh, and they're flirting and Luke mm. is hardcore into her. It's not just oh, like, yeah. Oh, she's cute. Um, he's hardcore into her. He's like, you know, he's really jealous of Han, and 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 they actually, and this to me adds a lot more character depth to uh to Luke's character, as well as Leia's reasons for not really pursuing Han on any level either. She says at one point, you know, uh, I suppose it's it's flattering his you know his comments and stuff, but you know, there's just not really that time when you're. Uh, one of the leaders of the rebellion. They don't have time for that. I'm too busy. So it, it gives her that little doorway of saying, well, I am interested, but there's just so much going on. We're trying to fight the empire. I don't have time <laughs> for personal things like like happiness and, and love, you know, whereas Han, who is coming from the other side of, um, you know, always kind of looking out for number one and, hey, yeah, I've signed on with these guys, but Gosh, this princess, I like her. <laughs> you know, I'm gonna I'm just gonna do here, you know, and he, he's persistent, of course, but it's one of those things that, you know, I think one of the things the Star Wars films lack is any sort of real real romance, real mm-hmm. development, yeah. especially of women characters. There's even a, a early strip in here where uh it, Leia goes off on her own to do something and is uh, you know, pretty badass. You know, they 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 realize she's a uh, you know the, the, who she is and she's like oh well now i really got to get out of here you know i can't i can't get captured you know so that yeah, that was cool and then uh the last bit with uh you know you really at the last the last bit when it opens the last uh, bit with williamson and and goodwin they uh they have luke and leia out scouting part one of the themes that runs through everything in here and even some of the uh, original star wars comics after the adaptation of a new hope is they're looking for a new permanent base uh for Mm -hmm. the rebels and it it keeps coming up as a as a plot point and uh so they're on a a jungle planet they end up finding imperial troopers on and stuff so they realize this ain't it we're not gonna have a base here but you can just tell that you know she's the one that's in charge she's the one that's leading it's not you know luke luke is still you know a pretty young kid that you know i guess what he's 1920 still and he's still young and inexperienced but leia even though she's not any older we know that because they're twins <laughs> um she's the one that's in charge she has the 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 knowledge and the uh the drive to lead things and i think that's a neat uh that's something that you get a little bit in the movies but not nearly mm. enough you know i mean yeah. she still plays in the movies a little more damsel in distress i mean sure at one point she takes the gun out of han and blows the hole in the the side of the hallway so they jump into the trash compactor and that's a a nice fun moment you know but it's not something that happens often enough yeah i I know what you're you're sort of saying with um with leia's character it's one of those strange things where it's one of those weird things with the franchise where when you have the original content from you know late 70s early 80s and with most franchises when they have films that are then they either just the running joke is the characters get older and older and it's like either an action film or a comedy or they reboot that's the most common thing you just go you know what this doesn't work start again or we're bored of this boom let's start again comics do it you know marvel and dc are Mm. notorious for doing it and obviously star wars they've just got they did it with disney took over but aside from that it's just even the films are kept, you know, they're not saying the films aren't canon. All the weird Ewok films and the Star Wars Holiday <laughs> special, that's not canon. No one needs to talk about Caravan of Courage. We don't need to go down that road. Come on, the but Star like, Wars the holiday, the Christmas <laughs> special, that's canon, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, part of it's on Disney Plus now, the little cartoon uh, where they meet Boba. That's is under vintage Star Wars, they've called it, uh, as well as the uh, some of the other stuff. So they are slowly putting some of the old school content on there, probably just because they've got so much money and they've got 20th Century Fox now. They're like, people are going to watch this. Why would you 
put it on there. Yeah. Eventually, they're going to release the holiday special in some way, <laughs> but they've they've released the one little. You can watch the cartoon of it, uh, and that's it. That's the only thing they're accepting even exists at the moment. Everything else is like, let's not touch the VR stuff with Chewie's granddad or dad or any. <laughs> but anyway, aside <laughs> aside from that weirdness, with um with a lot of the 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 weirdest thing about the Star Wars is because it's got a. a air quotes career spanning over 40 years but there hasn't been a solid reboot there's some book obviously the books have become legends etc etc but it's, it's weird having characters and and intellectual property from a film in the 80s getting brought back especially for the sequel trilogy with all these characters again it does have some jarring elements in some ways and i think that where from hearing you talk about uh some of the content you've been reading which is basically legends and some of the other legend stuff i know what it seems to be is what they're doing with the new store uh comics especially is basically just using basically 40 years of star wars comics and basically going right we like that bit we like that bit we like that bit and and picking them out it's it's it was a testing ground and i mean the comics nowadays are still really are a testing ground because you've got you know, you've got the movies of the big boys you've got the series that are the still quite big boys yeah. Then you've got the books that are a fairly big deal, but then comics are generally the least consumed of the Star Wars content. And games are sort of probably between series and the movies, I'd say. But the, the, what I've noticed is the comics, like at, at the moment, the the first run of the new Star Wars comics has ended. And that was 75 issues from 2015 to 2018, I think. The whole plot line, and that's set between Empire, uh, A New Hope and Empire Strikes Back. The whole plot is literally always them trying to find a new base. <laughs> That, that's so it's one of those things where it's like and they've been to a jungle planet and they've been so i am i assume i know that a lot of the comic authors and things like there's a guy called charles saul who's writing the now run of star wars which was set between empire strikes back and return of the jedi and he did a lot of vader stuff and lando and etc etc they read these comics when they were younger yeah so what's happening is obviously they're consuming all this old content getting inspired by it they get into a world of writing or being a comic author or whatever because i've heard a few interviews of different people and things and i've interviewed one of them myself (laughs) and hopefully there'll be more to come (laughs) um but like with these things it's like i think they consume a lot of that content they go i love this cool weirdness about star wars you don't have to have mark Hamill on screen doing stuff you can just have a cartoon version of luke doing weird stuff (laughs) and that's still cool and i think the comics are doing that as well like there's there's one big character which is in the comics which is one of the it's it's one of the weird things where it's it's a character that almost no one's heard of to some degree in the comics from uh the 77 stuff there's a bounty hunter called bailert valance in it who's a cyborg and he's one of the he's in the comics, yeah, he's, he shows up pretty soon. So I think he's like one of the earliest Star Wars characters that's new. I think he was in it before even Empire Strikes Back was was released. Okay. And so you get a character like that, which I'd not heard of. He, he doesn't really get mentioned that much. He's in a few stories and then he goes. Well, that was in the... I think his death was in like the 70s or 80s. He's in the new... Uh, ongoing series of bounty hunters and he's been he went to the imperial academy with han solo he was the antagonist of that story then in the target vader comics he's trying to pursue darth vader because he hates darth vader and it's because his home world basically screwed over by the empire and now he's the main character basically in the ongoing bounty hunter series alongside bosk and boba fett and all these other ones and you're just like but uh, when I'm reading them, I'm like, where the hell does this guy come from? You go into Legends, you go, oh, he's been about for like 40 odd years and has been doing nothing. So it's really interesting, sort of, previously, if you'd have got me several years ago and said, why don't you go back and read some more Legends stuff? Like, I would have gone, but surely, why would I read Legends when I could read Canon? And I've read a huge amount of Canon. I'm just like, why would I not read Legends? There's so many cool things that are birthed from Legends. And either you can go back and get the weirder side or almost the expanded side of yeah, things. Yeah. But there's so many cool things that I'm sure will show up in the future that they're holding on to. I'm sure they are taking stuff they remember because that's one thing about comics is there's a huge nostalgia element, I think, for comic book readers, uh, especially when you get to be an adult and you go back and – you pick up something you read as a kid and then if you're actually a comic book writer and you're writing something you go oh i remember when i was a kid i love that character i want to use them now what happened to them uh well they died here oh they died uh how do we bring them back but in the case of star wars all that legend stuff like you said is not part of the canon so you can cherry pick that that character that concept and reuse it in the way you want to and you can pay Mm -hmm. pay homage to your your childhood and those creators from then and and still do what you want to with them without having to 
trample over the uh, the previous continuity or anything. Kind of reinterpret it in a way. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, there's certainly some things from Star Wars Legends stuff that, you know, the old stuff that we don't need reinterpreted. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, it's like it's like their sense of what would aliens look like. It's like they thought, well, let's see, we got Hammerhead, who's kind of like a uh, a Hammerhead shark, and there's a Walrus Man. You know his real name. I just know him as Walrus Man. He kind of looks like some kind of animal a human uh, uh, earth animal and then okay how about a giant pink bunny yeah how about that <laughs> is he the one in the space suit yeah, right yeah, yeah he's he, he, he like a full-on character yeah, isn't he? he's jackson he's he's one of the the, the first char- the first new characters they introduce that sticks around for a while um uh, after uh, a new hope uh, is adapted in one through six it's he might be in seven or eight or something but he's definitely in nine and that storyline with the cloud riders or whatever and you're like uh a giant pink bunny Maybe not. <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> there's a race. There's some races in here that look, yeah, that's a Star Wars race. And others that go, a human cat that looks like they escaped from the cats movie. No, that's probably not. That's probably <laughs> not what, uh, you know. Oh, here's a frog. <laughs> here's a fro- uh, maybe not. <laughs> and his name is Gribbit. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, I mean, it's a testing ground, it isn't is, it? <laughs> it? It really is. But then, but then you have other stuff that's just you'll like have a spaceport scene that goes, oh, that's exactly what it would look like in Star Wars. That's exactly what a Star Wars spaceport mm-hmm. would look like. Um, yeah. So it's or, or this guy, this guy with half a half a head looks kind of like a a Cylon from Battlestar Galacta. Galactica half a head is a, a a robot and another half is human i could see that as a st- that, that works and the the and the facial you got a big pointed ear and sort of a you know knobby head i can see that that's a good one <laughs> yeah it's a star wars character yeah the the cat lady not so much <laughs> and that's the end of part one thanks as always for tuning in guys as i always say part two will be out next week on this very feed but if you can't wait that long then you can go over to patreon.com slash genuine chits chat and for as little as one pound a month you can get access to the patreon exclusive feed which will have all episodes of genuine chit chat when they're split in two as one full unsplit episode that gets released when part one gets released on the normal feed and you also get access to early access to other shows and whatnot in addition to my whole new show afterthoughts that I do with Megan, where we talk about movies and TV shows and that sort of thing, and we release episodes of that once or twice a week. So if you want to contribute as little as one pound a month to the show, and if you feel like the show deserves it and it entertains you enough to warrant it, please go over to patreon.com slash genuine chit chat. It is appreciated more than you know. So anyway, in part two, our conversation basically continues where it ended. We talk about the Star Wars comics for the majority of the next whole part of the podcast we talk about the daily newspaper strips the multimedia products they've been involved with matt's connection to star wars some of the more weird and zany things that we see some of the artwork and stuff we talk about so lots of really really cool stuff there so make sure you tune in next week for that you also got to make sure you check out the show notes where it's got information on max contact details where you can buy his batman politics in gotham book or rather the book that he contributed to uh, dc comics news where he writes reviews for and lots of other bits and pieces there so make sure you check the show notes for that too so what have we got coming up over the next few weeks then? I have got a conversation recorded with Goff of Beer Nuts Productions because he recently started a podcast and has a new comedy film out, so we spoke about that for about an hour. I've also got another two-parter with Tom Everett recorded uh, because there's a few things he wanted to tackle that we didn't tackle on our you know, episode that was released last week. So he came on again and we spoke about stagecraft and lots of other cool and crazy things there, but that one isn't going to be released for a few more weeks yet. I've also got a conversation due for recording tomorrow with a pop punk band and they're very good and i'm excited to have them on the show along with my mate tom and also next week i'm due to be recording with a gentleman whose hands were in a certain aspect of star wars return of the jedi quite heavily he is a quite an interesting individual and i'm incredibly excited to speak with him but i'm not going to mention it until i've got the recording in the bag so you know in a week's time i should have that recorded and then you guys will know who that is 
I've got other stuff in the pipeline for recording as well. A couple of other podcasters have been in contact and want to do it and a few other people involved with a few other bits and pieces here and there. So really exciting stuff for the future. But if you also become a supporter on Patreon, I normally put up a guest list at the start of each month, which confirms all of the confirmed guests, all the dates that I've got booked in for people, the recordings that I've got, and then some of the other ones which are people who have either said they'll come on the show but we haven't confirmed a date or some people that I'm hoping to get on in the future. So if you want even more of an insight into that, go over to Patreon. Aside from that, guys, there's a few bits. Like I recently was on Frank Burton's I Like the Sound podcast. A link to that is in the description. And I've also got my Star Wars show, which if you're listening to this one, you may already be aware of. But just in case you aren't, if you want to get into the world of Star Wars comics, but you don't want to have to buy any comics and you don't really know where to start, or if you've read all the Star Wars comics and you can't be bothered to go back and read them all, but you want to have a retelling of the narrative and a lot of the connections that they have to other Star Wars content and potentially some contradictions and things, go over to either YouTube or on the Genuine Chit Chat channel and you can watch or listen to rather every episode of Star Wars Comics and Canon on there or you can go on the feed of Comics in Motion which is where Matthew B. Lloyd's show is as well and every Saturday there is an episode of Star Wars Comics and Canon. I've tackled almost every Canon Marvel comic now that isn't an ongoing series. I've done one shots, mini series, the, so a lot of the Vader comics, some of the Afro comics, the main run of Star Wars comics, lots of those sort of bits and pieces. So if there's any comics that you haven't got in your collection and you're interested by them but you're not sure if you want to buy them yet listen to my show i go through the narrative i just kind of explain what things are in a fair amount of detail but i've done it in a specific way so that if you've never touched a souls comic in your life you can get on with this podcast because i explain enough and talk about you know species and characters and where you've heard that name before and where it comes from and how this impacts that but also in a way that if you've read the comic before it doesn't take away. I want people to listen to the show, get into Star Wars comics like I am, or at least near to what I am, and then if they enjoy the show, then they go out and buy some of the Star Wars comics because some of them are just absolutely excellent and are really worth checking out. So that's really enough plugging and all that sort of jazz from me, guys. Check out my Star Wars show. Check out my Patreon. If you go on there, there's two episodes completely for free right now, so there's no excuse not to go to patreon.com slash genuine chit chat, and you can listen to mine and Megan's talking on Star Wars The Phantom Menace and also on the first season of the show The Witcher. So guys, thank you as always for listening, especially up to the end. It means the absolute world to me. Give Matt loads of love on the Twitterverse and tune in next week to hear the rest of our conversation. So thank you as always for listening, guys, and I'll talk to you next week.